Hey everyone, welcome back. In today's video, we are diving into something that is super crucial in modern web applications, which is OAuth 2. We will break down what OAuth is, why it is used, and its flows that make it all work. By the end of this video, you will have a solid understanding of core concepts behind OAuth. So let's get into it. In the early days of internet, sharing information between services was simple but risky. Suppose if you want to use the services of a website, let's name it as service A, but you do not want to create an account in that service. Instead, you want to use your already created account in another service. Let's name that other service as service B. That service B is having an auth server. So service B holds your details such as name and email ID, which is required for service A. So for that, you provide your credentials of service B to service A and service A will directly log into service B using your credentials and access your information. This method was unsafe because number one, it puts your credentials at risk as you are giving your credentials to service A. And also there is no guarantee that service A would only access the required details from service B as you do not have any control over what service A can access. To overcome these problems, OAuth was introduced. By following these standards, we don't need to share our credentials of service B to service A. It also allows us to control what data we want to share from one service to another service. Most importantly, we can also revoke the permission of any service whenever we want. Let us try to understand this with a very simple example. Suppose there is a website wishit.com which many people use to send wishes over the emails. And you also want to use this website to wish your friends and contacts of your Gmail account on the occasion of Diwali or New Year. Also, you do not want to create a new account in this website and want to make use of your Gmail account details only. Also, if you create a new account, then you also have to remember and manage its username and password, which you do not want to do. In this case, implementing OAuth will help you satisfy all your requirements. You will act as a resource owner because you are the owner of your email contact list. The application wishit.com using which you want to send the wishes will be the client and also will be requesting to access your data which is the contact list from your Gmail account. Now let us see how the complete flow might work using OAuth. First you open wishit.com and there it asks you to log in, but you are neither registered on this website nor you are planning to provide all your details to them, but still want to use their service. Then it presents you with an option of sign up or login via Google. You click on that and it takes you to Google login page. There you provide your Google login details and authenticate yourself. After that, you will be redirected to a permission page where you will decide if you want to give wishit.com access to your Google account details. In this, there will be an option to share the email contact list which wishit.com will be using to send the festival wishes. Once you approve this, wishit.com will be able to access your Google details which you have permitted. In this scenario, OAuth is working under the hood. Wishit.com will receive a temporary authorization code which it will use to get an access token from your email provider. OAuth 2 is an open standard for access delegation. Delegation is the keyword here. It means the access related responsibilities are delegated to some other application instead of handling it in your own application. OAuth allow third party applications to access user resources without sharing the user credentials. Like in our example, third party application wishit.com accessed Gmail contact list of the user without handling any authentication or sharing the user credentials. This way, you don't need to create and remember username and password for every website. Plus, your credentials stay secure since they are not directly shared with the third party website. In our example, we have already discussed the different roles, but let us just reiterate it in a formal way. There are four different roles in OAuth 2. The first role is resource owner. It is you, the user who owns the data. Data could be your Gmail profile or email. Another role is client. It is the application or website, which was wishit.com in our example, that wants to access your data like your email list. Third role is resource server. It is where your data is stored. In this case, Google server 
is where your complete profile detail is stored. The last role is authorization server. It is the system which verifies if the user is valid. In our example, it was Google that checks if you are really you by making you log into the Google system using username and password. And on successful authentication, it gives a token to the website to access the data you have permitted. Now, if you see, we have followed multiple steps in our example for completing the authentication and sharing the required information. That was one of the way to implement OAuth, but it is not the only way. OAuth support different flows based on different use cases. The most common flow is authorization code flow. This flow is used when you need to log into website through a third party services like Google. It is mainly for server side applications where security is a top priority. It also ensures that a website doesn't directly handle your username and password. Let us see step by step how this flow works. First you click on login with Google or any other service on the website. Then the website sends a request to the service you have picked like Google authorization server. Then you are redirected to Google's login page where first you log in and then shown a permission page. This page shows the data like your name and email that the website wants to access. Sometimes you can even choose which data you want to share. Once you approve the access, then Google sends an authorization code back to the website. Now the website sends that authorization code back to Google in exchange of access token. And finally, the website uses this access token to access your data, whichever you have permitted from the Google server. The key benefit of this flow is that your credentials like your passwords are never exposed to the website and the access token stays safe, making it very secure process. Now you might be thinking that why do we have this extra trip to get access token when we already have the authorization code with us. This extra step is added to make sure that only valid third party application is trying to access the user data. Because the third party application needs to send their client ID and secret along with the authorization code to get a valid access token. This verifies that the request comes from legitimate client. If an attacker somehow intercepts the authorization code, which is possible during the user browser interactions, they couldn't use it to access the resource directly because they wouldn't have the client's credentials, which was client ID and secret, because without these, they cannot exchange the authorization code for an access token. This reduces the risk of attacks such as man in the middle or code interception. The disadvantage of this extra trip is it adds an extra step which increases the response time. But this trade-off is considered worth it because the added security outweighs the minor overhead of that extra step. The authorization code flow was designed with security as the highest priority, especially for the sensitive data and services. All right, let's talk about one more flow, the implicit flow. This one is mainly for single page applications. These applications are running entirely in your browser. They do not have a backend server to handle the usual step of exchanging authorization code. Now let us see how it works. At first, the client, which is your application, sends the user to authorization server. It can be Google, Facebook, or any other provider. Then the user log in and gives permission to the application. Now here the flow becomes different from authorization code flow. In implicit flow, instead of getting an authorization code first, the client skips this step and gets the access token directly in the URL. Now the app can use this access token to access the user data from resource server. The main point here is that there is no code exchange. So you get the access token right away. But it is not much secure because token is exposed to the browser, making it more vulnerable to attacks. I hope till this point everything is clear to you. If not, you can rewatch the video and let me know in the comment section so that I can try to clear your doubts. Now, we have more flows supported in OAuth 2, but I'm not going to cover them all in this video because they consist of similar steps which we have already discussed in these first two flows. They are present just to implement specific use cases. Now I want you to go through this website from where you can learn about the remaining flows. These are very simple flows and if you have understood the first two flows clearly, then understanding these should not be hard. So that was it for a quick introduction to OAuth. In our next video, I will show you how to implement authorization code flow using a Spring Boot application and GitHub as a provider. If you like the video, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss the new updates. If this video was helpful, don't forget to drop a like 
and let me know in the comments your feedback once again thank you so much for watching i'll see you in the next video till then happy coding